Hey everyone, it's Chris Abado, and I'm back with another mapping adventure. Today, we're at Sewell Park inside of San Marcos, Texas, and we're gonna have a blast. While this is not the easiest thing in the world, it is my hope that everyone tuning in leaves feeling like they learned something and had a lot of fun along the way. So, without further ado, let's cut away to the project breakdown. So, the first step when embarking on any new mapping project is to define what kind of map it is you're trying to make. Now, the two basic distinctions are that of survey maps versus GIS maps. The key distinction between these two approaches lies in their objective. Professional surveys are conducted exclusively to accurately represent a specific local area. This means that survey maps prioritize utmost precision, which allows them to be used as authoritative data for engineering plans, legal descriptions, and construction projects where one to two centimeters of accuracy is required. On the other hand, GIS maps provide the flexibility required to analyze and visualize spatial data, albeit with some trade-off in terms of absolute accuracy. This means that they can have an incredible reach, even spanning the entire globe. By leveraging the power of data, GIS users can analyze, overlay, and symbolize data in a way that brings spatial patterns to life. They add symbols and thematic elements to add extra meaning to the map, which can then be used to identify problems, predict changes, set priorities, and understand the tasks at hand. Since GIS users are not forced to rely solely on primary data, they can do all this without even stepping away from their desktop. It's like having a whole world of insights right at your fingertips. Because of this high degree of flexibility, GIS maps are tools in almost every industry today. Since the topographic survey we are conducting today is going to be inside of ArcGIS Pro, it functions as sort of a GIS survey hybrid map, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So let's get into the research and preparation portion of the video and our project breakdown. Welcome to the project breakdown. This portion of the video will show you how to prepare for data collection using ArcGIS Online. In three steps, we will find the official parcel data of the survey site, create map features that are ready for GPS data collection, and lastly, we'll talk about how to export created features to ArcGIS Online. First, let's begin by following this link. As you can see, it takes us to a page that has the surveyed plats for all of Hayes County. Here, we can find the parcel for Sewell Park and all of its relative legal information. This is a good example of how surveys leverage their high accuracy and reliability to enable them to be used authoritatively. With this information, we can now load into ArcGIS Pro with our parcel boundaries and begin creating our feature classes. Since we are focusing on surveying the elevation at Sewell, we are going to be creating the spot elevation feature class first. When creating the spot elevation layer, we want to be sure to specify it as a point feature. Finally, let's change the coordinate system to State Plane Zone FPS 4204. Using a localized projection like this, make sure that we maintain the 1 to 2 centimeters of accuracy that we are striving for. After creating the feature, the next step is to add GPS metadata fields. or we reuse the fields it creates to map our contours and display the coordinate geometry of the boundary. There's altitude, the coordinates, as well as the accuracy of the fix. After repeating the process for each feature class, we can begin sharing them as web layers to ArcGIS Online. This makes them available on the cloud and enables mobile data collection with our Battle Flex. As you can see, there is a brief error, but it is easily fixed by auto-assigning sequential IDs. The web layer was published successfully, and after repeating the process for each feature class, we can begin sharing them as web layers to ArcGIS Online. So after each one is added, we'll be able to collect data inside of field maps while out in the field. That concludes the research portion of the video, so let's get on to phase two, conducting our survey and collecting data. Today's mapping project will look a little different from my mill project because we're tapping into the survey room. As you saw in the research portion of the video, conducting a survey takes a lot of work and extensive desktop recon. But now that we're here and we've got that out of the way, 
we can enjoy the water and the landscape a little bit while we talk about the history of the park. The key attraction at Seoul is the San Marcos River, which is fed by an extensive network of natural springs from Spring Lake. The upstream portion of the river boasts incredible biodiversity and is home to many endangered species. We have Texas wild rice, the San Marcos and Texas blind salamanders, and the fountain darter, just to name a few. Seoul's rich history is also closely tied to the community's strong connection to nature and its preservation. Since the park's establishment in 1916, it's become a cherished gathering space for families, students, and nature enthusiasts alike. Today, Seoul Park stands as a testament to the town's commitment to preserving and celebrating the serene beauty of the San Marcos River and the surrounding landscape. Now that we know the area a little bit better, let's discuss our game plan for conducting this survey. To reach the high degree of accuracy required by surveying standards, we're going to be using the Battle Flex inside of Extreme Mode, which means we'll have access to RTK corrections provided by Point One Navigation. This means that we'll be able to get down to that survey grade 1 to 2 centimeters of accuracy. Since this is a topographic survey, the spot elevations that we record will be crucial to the outcome of our map, which is why I'll be systematically collecting these spot elevations in a grid by walking 15 foot transects. Then, we will collect the rest of the park's features and fill in some gaps in our spot elevations. But before we get started, always remember that safety comes first. That means wearing your high visibility survey vest while you're out collecting data. Once you have your vest on, it's also prudent to do a quick check around the site for any possible hazards. With that out of the way, let's get to it guys. When we encounter areas of rapid elevation change, it's important to take additional data points to make sure the area is represented accurately and detailed. Man-made structures like this wall provide a unique challenge, especially inside of ArcGIS. When I first mapped this wall, the data produced an incomplete view and lacked the distinct drop-off that is characteristic of a wall like this. To append the data, we are going to increase our coverage and take about another 100 points. So that was a lot of fun. If you can't tell, I really love being at the river. So with all our data collected, let's get back to the lab and make our map. At long last, we have the final map products for our survey at Sewell Park. These maps were created solely by the points we collected in the field. And at the end of this, we actually managed to collect over 800 points. While the maps are no doubt similar, we can now begin exploring how they differ, as well as what the process for making maps like these in ArcGIS Pro looks like. Here is the map presented in a way that is as close as possible inside of ArcGIS Pro to what an actual surveyor would deliver. Key things to note about this map are that it's displayed to look like a single layer. It includes the coordinate geometry of the boundary, has a legal description, and its authoritative use. The features are displayed without exaggerating feature overlay. This means that they are drawn in a single layer and no one feature sits above or below another. Because we are working in Pro, overlays were unavoidable during the mapping process, but here their visual effects have been minimized so that our elevation data is shown discreetly by contour lines. The coordinate geometry, or COGO for short, refers to the distance and direction between two points. Here, these values are shown as the blue and black labels on each of our boundaries. These values were created by calculating the geometry between our coordinates to produce a distance and bearing from one to another. This description consists of written directions that use the coordinate geometry to describe our survey boundary. This enables anyone to follow our boundary in the future by starting at the origin and following the bearing to the specified distance. Lastly, this map has to be noted as only for educational purposes so it does not get accidentally used as official data. 
This is doubly important because surveyors assume liability if anything is off in their maps, which perfectly exemplifies the level of responsibility that organizations expect from surveyors. Now, we can focus on our GIS interpretation of the map. Some immediate differences are the use of overlays and rasters. By overlaying data, features are layered to superimpose themselves inside of our digital elevation model. Transparency, drawing order, and color are all manipulated to provide a thematic experience that encapsulates the conclusion of our analysis. This use of overlays also allows us to generate new data layers from pre-existing ones, which is how the contour and sidewalk features were created. A huge benefit of mapping inside of ArcGIS Pro is that it allows us to create a continuous surface like this digital elevation model you see in the back. Every cell in this elevation raster has a value that was interpolated using the altitude of our topo points. This process assigns each cell the most likely value based on the neighboring topo points. By symbolizing different values as different colors, we are able to fully visualize the topography of our section of Soul Park. This interpolation method is also why we were forced to take so many points at the wall, but now we can see that they serve to give us a clear image of what's going on here, even better than the survey interpretation in some cases. Overall, I really enjoyed making these maps. Getting to explore the realm of surveying has been exciting. I genuinely hope that this project and the maps we produced can help bridge the gap between surveyors and GIS analysts in the future. Now, let's get back to Sewell Park so we can enjoy the scenery one last time. It really is amazing how, with the right equipment and know-how, data can reveal all sorts of insights about the environment. This level of detail would have been unattainable without the high accuracy from extreme mode. So whether you live in survey land, GIS land, or some hybrid of the two, Bad Elf is engineering magic to deliver the accuracy you need in the environment you need it in. If you had fun during my latest mapping adventure and were impressed by what you saw, I encourage you to check out Bad Elf and explore the capabilities of what our hardware and solutions can do for you. Stay mappy, everybody. This is Chris the Bad Elf, signing off.